Again, good morning, everyone. Where did, um, oh dear, it's going to be one of those days where I can't remember names. Wiley and Donna go. I wanted to thank them for the music, and they're gone. Wherever you are, thank you. <laughs> uh, I have to admit that I like their music better than the canned music. Yes, I can. Theirs was, I don't know, it, I just liked it better. Um, speaking of music, um, music played a very large role in my conversion. Um, the music meant as much to my soul as did the Word of God. Um, and of course, God knows how to reach everybody wherever they're at, so um, uh, I think that's why music is such an important thing. And we have a whole entire book in the Bible dedicated to music. Um, although we don't have the music itself, we have the words, which is unfortunate that we don't have the music, because I would really like to know the music. That's one of the ways that um, uh, God's people communicated their love for God, not only to Him, but to one another. Uh, and um, so I'm looking forward to the music in heaven. I think it's going to be better than anything we've ever heard down here. And I've heard some pretty good music down here. I've heard some really good music down here. So, we'll get fired up, warmed up, get going. Now this needs to be larger, wider, maybe I'll put that there, put this over here, we'll get rearranged, well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this Sabbath day, we thank you for Jesus and the example he set for us, and most of all we thank you for your grace that um, has provided us uh, your unmerited love. We ask for your Holy Spirit to help us this morning to um, uh, learn from this lesson. It is a very important lesson, um, especially in these latter times. Uh, we don't talk much about it, but um, there will come a time when your people will be put to the test, whether they will obey your word or die. So we ask now that this lesson might um, strengthen our faith through your word, through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For anybody that doesn't know, my name is Jerry, and since I can't remember most everybody else's name, when it's your turn to talk, please state your name so we can all learn each other's name for those of us like me who don't know each other's name. And I always ask this question, how many read their lesson this week? Yeah. Oh, goody, 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 goody. Terrific, terrific. Um, better get my glasses out. That's too far away. It's not far enough away to see. There's Wiley. Thank you for the music. I don't know where your wife went, but... Okay. I have to ask the question. Did this week's lesson in any way... Um, cause you to, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask two questions. Number one, you remember what our pastor, the survey he had last week. Remember that survey? Okay. Um, I think this week's lesson went along very well with that survey, particularly the question of, are you confident in your salvation? Yes, no, or question mark. Um, and I'm sure some of us answered yes, some of us answered no, and some of us answered question mark. Um, and that's not, um, there's nothing wrong with that because, um, well, after his sermon last week and that survey, mostly the survey, um, uh, I did a lot of thinking about that this week and in preparation for this lesson, it seemed to go together uh, for me because here we have three men who were in captivity. 
They were in a land they did not know. They were serving a king they did not know. Uh, they learned a language they did not know. Um, their whole entire life had been thrown into a tizzy because of their captivity in Babylon. And yet they remained faithful to God. Um, now, to my knowledge, um, there's nothing in Daniel that indicates that uh, they kept the Sabbath or that they could keep the Sabbath. So we don't know that at all. We know that Daniel and his friends prayed. We know that Daniel prayed three times a day. Um, we know that uh, they were tested in their faith right away by not eating unclean food. And God rewarded that faith and rewarded that um, commitment by giving them, and let's make sure we understand this, God gave them that extra uh, intelligence. It wasn't because of the food they ate. Because there's a lot of people out there that their diet is really good and they're probably dumber than a pile of sticks. And there's people out there that eat terrible and they're geniuses. So let us keep in mind that that diet did not give them the uh, ten times smarter. God gave that to them. So that was a faith builder right there, wasn't it? Um, and then, of course, uh, it came to the time for um, the dream. And uh, we, we, think about, we think about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and we kind of pass over the top and say, well, he had a really great dream, and we know what the dream was about, and Daniel and his friends prayed to God, and God gave them the interpretation of the dream and this and that kind of stuff. But let's not forget that the... Nebuchadnezzar said, if I do not get, if somebody does not give me this dream and the interpretation are of, all the wise men in the kingdom are going to die. And so this was already a death threat. And, and when you get right down to it, the very first test was kind of a death threat too because if the captain of the eunuchs had said, no way, you're eating what you're told to eat or you die, he could have easily said that. Why didn't he say that? He knew, he knew that God was with him and that he would just bless him. Okay. That was Kenneth, by the way. New rule, everybody's got to say their name before they start talking so I can learn their name. But I know your name. Don't know your last name, but that's not important. Know your first name, that's the important part. Um, okay, so was this guy already a nice guy? Captain of the eunuchs? I think the captain of the eunuchs was prompted by God. And my name is Don up here at the computer. And I think God actually impressed upon the eunuch that these were men of God and that Let's check it out. Let's see if this God is for real. And he pressed upon him that maybe we'll give him a chance and see what happens. Amen. God is still in control. And I'm of a firm belief that God's Holy Spirit impressed this um, uh, eunuch, just as Don said, to give these guys a chance. Um, let's go back a little farther than that. Um, why were they in Babylon in the first place? Um, don't tell me. I know this woman, and I cannot remember her name. I hate that. Marie. Thank you. That's because of all the sins of Israel. Because God told them this was going to happen, and if they didn't, and they, changed, they didn't make any changes, so they went there for 70 years. Okay, they were in Babylon because they were bad, right? Hi. And also, the prophecy state. This is Ron up here <laughs> upstairs. This is Ron from the heaven. <laughs> uh, they were also went to captivity, the prophecy said, for 70 years, for every year that they broke the seventh day Sabbath by opening the gates of Jerusalem and trading on the Sabbath. They were told they'd go into captivity. That was the other reason. All right, so, uh, and how many times did God warn them to turn from their ways or they would go into captivity? 
I don't know, I never counted it. Probably lots and lots of times. Not only that, but um, uh, once it got to a point where there was no turning back, you are going into captivity, uh, they still didn't repent. There, there, were, there was no repentance there so what, so whatsoever. So, um, uh, for us nowadays, keeping the Sabbath important and uh, uh, not eating unclean foods are important, um, just like they were in Daniel's day. Um, and so, that was their, they were being tested, weren't they? God wanted to know if these four Hebrews were going to be faithful to him. Now, this is the only story we have of their captivity, other than some of the prophets. Um, and we don't know what other tests that uh, God's people may have uh, come under uh, in Babylon. I'm sure there was, God loved everybody, and he wants everybody to be saved. And God was working on Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't he? He was testing him, giving him an opportunity to believe. And uh, if God loves Nebuchadnezzar, who God used to punish his people, then I bet God loves everybody. What do you think? You think he loves everybody? I think so, too. Has anybody here had a um, situation in which they were in where if they went along with man instead of obeying God, that um, the consequences would be severe. And I'm not necessarily talking about death, just severe consequences. And that includes loss of a job. Okay. Many have been in that position where uh, job loss was um, critical. Um, I have read stories where people were put to a severe test um, not only did they lose their job, but they couldn't find another one. And they're, they were living off the grace of God by, from people that were providing food for them uh, for months in some cases before um, finally they got a job and were able to support themselves. So the test can be severe. Um, but these three Hebrews would positively not bow down to this idol. Um, something I think we should uh, keep in mind about the idol itself was, according to the teacher's help, this was not a statue of a, a man. Like in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this guy was, I mean, he was a statue. The head of gold, uh, arms and breasts of silver. Um, Legs of brass, was it brass? I believe it was brass. And then feet of iron and clay. Pardon? Right, uh, right. The legs were iron and then the feet were um, clay and iron mixed. So this was quite a... And although we don't know, um, artists have rendered this drawing as being of a man, right? Head of gold. Pretty impressive figure. That's not exactly what this statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made. Um, and, pardon? I heard somebody say something. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. See, my hearing isn't so good. Uh, <coughs> sounds like you said something. Um, so, this statue was, uh, well, this statue was roughly 60 feet tall. Um, but it was only about six feet wide, which is not the dimensions of a man. A, man, uh, a man's dimensions, a statue's dimensions are roughly six to one. For every six feet high, you have about one foot, maybe a foot and a half wide. But this statue wasn't like that. This statue was 60 feet high and maybe six feet wide. So it really wasn't a statue of a man as far as we know. It was probably more likely, and it was all gold, so it was probably more likely a statue, um, and it doesn't say if it, was, it looked like a man. It could have been a statue uh, with several different gods on this statue. Um, we need to remember that in uh, ancient times, and even in modern day places now, that religion and politics are intertwined very, very tightly. Um, 
not so much worldwide nowadays, but in uh, Daniel's time, um, uh, the gods you worshipped were important, and if you're, you were the king, you made sure the people worshipped the gods of your country. This was very, uh, very much a test of loyalty. Um, so, why do you suppose Nebuchadnezzar decided to make this statue? Remember, this is after the dream he had. Why would did he want, why did he make this statue? Kenneth. And then... He made the statue because he wanted to prove the vision wrong. He made it all of gold to make sure to say that his kingdom would last. There would be no other kingdom. Okay. This is Dave, and I agree 100% with Kenneth. There's also another reason, because I believe it's very possible there was a possible rebellion going on at this, at this particular time when he was fashioning this statue. And um, he wanted to make that statue to bring all of the anybody who's anybody together, all of this governmental folks mm -hmm. together to, to try to bring allegiance. But I believe there was a, a brewing rebellion going on somewhere in there. And I, I can't, of course, I can't also Jerry, remember the theologian that told me that, but, yeah. but that, uh, he based that on some history. There's, there's so many questions that we have that we don't have the answers to. Um, and I think it's okay to speculate but not to put that speculation into his facts. You know, it could have been this, it could have been that, it could have been something else. Richard? Nebuchadnezzar was the leader of the, of the church back then. And he wanted to, he wanted to uh, promote his church. And, and that church, that, that, that statue represented his church. Of course, the devil was behind that. And so he was glorying in, in everybody that was bowing to him rather than to the Creator. Okay. Um, idolatry, right? Idolatry. Maria. And I think the other thing we have to realize that Nebuchadnezzar, since he was born, he was treated different than anybody else, that he was superior, that he was going to be a king. So for him to all of a sudden change all his process of thinking of who he was, it's going to take a little bit of while because everybody else around him supported the ideology he was superior, he was a god. Right. Um, and that was nothing unusual about that. Um, when we, we can look at, uh, just say, we, if we look at Israel, uh, Israel was ruled by God. There was no kings. Uh, but they didn't like that. They wanted to be, unfortunately, they wanted to be like the nations around them and have a king to lead them. So God gave them what they asked for. So that's a lesson right there. We need to be careful what we ask for because God might give it to us. Go ahead, Kelly. Back in antiquity, um, it was customary to worship your rulers as God, especially in Egypt, which I believe predated Babylon. The, the pharaohs were gods, and the yes, people were. worshipped their, their leaders and I think this could have been a, a carryover from that, from Egypt, that Babylon was emulating, worshiping their leaders. One thing, um, to my knowledge, there has, other than the Israelites, and uh, in, in speaking of antiquity, um, other than the Israelites, most other um, countries worshipped multiple gods. Uh, we look at the Greeks, we look at the Romans, uh, the Babylonians, um, even the uh, people around um, Israel when they were in the Promised Land worshipped more than one God. So, uh, and oftentimes, um, whoever the leader was, if they had a favorite God, that God was kind of worshipped a little bit more and held in reverence a little bit more than another God. Um, so, this is... This is uh, Another reason to suspect that maybe this statue wasn't just of Nebuchadnezzar, it was Nebuchadnezzar and the gods that they worshipped. Uh, Stan. My name's Shuli Uli Ubash. <laughs> and uh, my, my point is that... Uh, so you want us to call you that all the time? Yeah, yeah. 
Shuli Uli Umash, yeah. No, um, every, uh, the, the people around them, the Babylonians, they had a, a, a god for a certain thing. You know, they worshipped uh, Ra for the sun god, they, for the sun. Uh, they worshipped something else uh, for fertility, you know. But our god supplies all of our needs. We, don't, we have one God that, that uh, supplies everything we need. We don't have to worry about, um, you know, appeasing this God over here or that God over there. That's true. Um, now let's look at the situation that the Hebrews were in. It's not just the fact that this statue was probably represented uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar and multiple gods. Also, the fact that it was all gold, Nebuchadnezzar was like, okay, I had the dream, and Daniel said it came from God. But was he not challenging God by putting up this statue? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, you're not going to last forever, Nebuchadnezzar. Your kingdom will not last forever. Nebuchadnezzar probably knew he wouldn't live forever, but... He wanted his kingdom to last forever. And when he found out that wasn't going to happen, he didn't like that much. And that's such a typical response from the human point of view. What do you mean it's not going to last forever? Um, what about all the wonderful things I have done? Won't they last forever? Now we have the memory of Babylon. We have information about Babylon. And some people would say, well, that's uh, lasting forever. But that wasn't good enough for Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted his kingdom to be forever. So, uh, I believe Tish. that King Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, my name is Tish, um, I think that King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to make the major statement that his kingdom would last forever and he wanted to make that very clear that no other, no other kingdom would ever overthrow Babylon. And also, I don't know why this bothers me, but uh, the Bible says that the image was 60 cubits high, and the cubit is 18 inches. And so it was about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And as to whether it was... I tend to think that we can pretty much assume that it was an image after the one that he dreamt about or very similar to it, except that it was all gold, because in that image it said it was a great image, and then he built an image that is all gold instead of uh, the, uh, the four, four different metals. And I think he was making the statement, no, my kingdom will never end, no matter what anybody says, including God. Well, um, you're right, it was really high, and I was told a long time ago that a cubit is from the elbow to the tip of the finger, and of course that makes it different for everybody. And I don't know if Noah had really long arms, <laughs> Or maybe they were really short, I don't know. It seems like the ark he built wasn't big enough to hold two of all the animals, but nonetheless. Um, Dave. Dave. Here's just a, a tiny sidebar. Uh, when Saddam Hussein was around, he was a great fan of Nebuchadnezzar, and he was a great fan of creating a new Babylon. If you, if you study, uh, you don't probably need to study Saddam Hussein, but he also fashioned a chariot which was supposedly of gold, <laughs> and it was fashioned supposedly in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar uh, influenced other kingdoms as well, down to our modern time even. Yes, yes they did. As a matter of fact, um, it's interesting that you brought that up because as I recall, um, one of the things that uh, Saddam Hussein was trying to do was to rebuild Babylon on its, on its original location to deny what, or to counteract what the Bible says that it's going to be a habitation of wild animals. Okay, so not to contradict Tish any, but I'm going to go with the statue being more than just a, a man, right? 92, 90, 90 feet tall. It's pretty tall, isn't it? You know, what's that, an eight-story building? Seven stories? We don't even have any buildings that tall in Kingman that I know of. So, um, and as far as the, the width, uh, something that tall made out of gold, I would think they would have had to have attached it to a pedestal. Otherwise, it wouldn't take much for it to fall over. So we're going to go with uh, Nebuchadnezzar maybe at the top and representation of the gods on the way down. It's on a pedestal on the plain of Dora. 
which according to the helps and the teachers quarterly uh, is translated a, a, a walled place. So if the statue is on the plain of Dura and it's in a walled place, um, it's practically a sanctuary, isn't it? If it's in a walled place, now I don't know if the walls were part of the mountain, um, but it certainly has the, uh, uh, what's the word, um, has the uh, imitation of a sanctuary in the thought. Plus they had a furnace. Now, it's called a fiery furnace. What was in the sanctuary in uh, the God's temple that is similar to a fiery furnace? Well, they had an altar, right? And what did they do on that altar? They burned the uh, offerings. So this wasn't too far off uh, for these Hebrew men to realize that, hey, this is a sanctuary. They have an altar um, that they're going to threaten to sacrifice people on if they don't bow down to this God. And um, uh, the, it, this was like, you know, okay, here's, here it is. Here's the test. What are you going to do? Now, this story is in Daniel, and we want to think that Daniel wrote the story, but Daniel is absent from this story completely. He's not mentioned whatsoever. We don't know where he's at. There's been a lot of theological and just plain ordinary speculation as to where Daniel was. Um, but I want to get to that a little bit later. Um, but Daniel's not around, just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now they were already um, uh, had positions of authority, maybe not great authority, but they had positions of authority and um, uh, importance in this kingdom. And uh, I kind of think that maybe when Daniel was relating the king's dream to him, that after your kingdom is coming this, and after that kingdom, and after that kingdom, there was more in the uh, throne room of the king than just Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. My guess is there were other servants around. Perhaps, um, well, if I had been a um, uh, person of authority in uh, Babylonian times with Nebuchadnezzar as my king, I'd have been there just to find out, is Daniel going to save us or not? So there was probably a lot of people in there hearing what the king's dream is. Now, when Daniel told the king that you have a great kingdom and it's made out of gold, but it's not going to last forever. It's going to be overthrown. And then that one's going to be overthrown and that one's going to be overthrown. And eventually there will be a kingdom that will not be overthrown that will overthrow all these kingdoms. Now if all these people heard that, like uh, Dave said, maybe there was kind of a, a rebellion. Like, you know, hey, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to last forever. We really don't have to do everything he says because someone's going to take his place here one of these days. Someone's going to overrule his kingdom. So it's very possible that there was a little bit of you know mutiny going on behind the scenes, maybe a word here and there, and Nebuchadnezzar decided, you know, I've got to nip this in the bud. I've got to show these people that I am king. i got to show them that our gods are superior to Daniel's gods. And so this kind of sets up the whole mess. We've got a, a sanctuary with an altar. We've got a statue. Now, there was no statue in God's sanctuary, so that was clearly an uh, indication that this was going to be idol worship, wasn't it? Um, and the people were gathered around. There was music. Was there not music in God's sanctuary? Yes, you most definitely have. So this is really close to being um, a worship service. And that's, of course, what Nebuchadnezzar wanted it to be. He wanted everybody to bow down and worship this statue, uh, this image, shall we say, and um, to show their allegiance not only to the uh, image and to their gods, but to Nebuchadnezzar himself and his kingdom. Because in uh, antiquities, and even nowadays in some cases, um, Uh, patriotism isn't just about you know dying for your country or saluting the flag or those kind of things. Patriotism is you in those days was you better worship the gods that we tell you to worship. Um, or as Nebuchadnezzar pointed out, you will die. So 
Nebuchadnezzar said, when the music starts playing, everybody will bow down to this idol. Is that exactly what he said? Did he say, everybody will bow down? Did he say, and worship? Oops. Wake up. Uh, let me back up here. Yeah, ver verse 5 says, uh, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn and all those other instruments, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has said. That's right. You had to fall down and worship the golden image. Worship. That was the real thing, wasn't it? Worship the golden image. Now, how do we worship? How do we worship God? In what forms do we worship God? Can it's just one or two words? Prayer. Singing. Prayer? Okay, we worship God with prayer. How else? We mentioned it earlier. Music. Do we not worship God with music? How else do we worship God? Tithes and offerings. Very good. Study of Scripture. Studying Scripture. Reading the Bible. Pardon? Okay. When we go out and look at nature and we see what a wonderful thing God has created, that's a form of worship. What else? Witnessing? What else? Obedience. We worship God with obedience. We worship God when we pray, don't we? So we have all these ways of worshiping God. Sometimes we don't. We kneel in church sometimes, and I don't know how much everybody kneels when they pray at home. Um, but I'll say this: perhaps um, I'm wrong. We don't kneel a lot. We don't bow down to God a lot physically. Bow down to God. Um, so, really, worship for us would be not so much bowing down, but all these other things. Well. Nebuchadnezzar didn't ask them to do all those other things. Nebuchadnezzar just said, bow down to worship. So they could have bowed down and said in their minds, we're not worshiping this idol. We're just bowing down because the king said us to, told us to. Is that okay? No? Why not? Okay. Nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children, third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Very good. So, bowing down as everybody else did, regardless of what was in their mind, regardless of what they do, why was it not only to the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego personally, but what else would it have made a difference in? To them personally and to who else? Also God, yes. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, Shelley. All the other people that were there. That's right. They were supposed to obey their God, and if they chose to just pretend and, and say in their mind, then they're, they're not showing everybody else who they're really worshiping. That's right. It had everything to do with obedience to God. And this is, uh, this is something we need to remember, and it's not always easy, but we need to remember that whatever the circumstances are, um, if we obey God rather than men, who takes responsibility for the outcome? God takes the responsibility for the outcome. When we obey God, um, he is responsible for what happens after that because you did what God asked you to do and he takes that responsibility on himself. Dave. Well, I was thinking of the opposite. Can it also be uh, misleading if we're praying and we're bowing, bowing down in church and our heart is really not with God, we're, we're not connected there? Could that be something kind of similar? Oh, absolutely. And who knows our thoughts? God knows our thoughts. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had, they had great faith. God had probably done more than just the stories in Daniel to build their faith. Um, 
also um, because of the fact that they were in Babylon, um, God did what he said he was going to do, didn't he? And so they knew that, you know, God is serious. If we do not worship the one true God, then um, we're going to end up here or worse. Now, let's not forget that not all the Israelites were taken into captivity. Many of them were killed in the battle. And if we look at the siege of Jerusalem, um, it was really bad. So uh, these three young Hebrews had plenty of um, evidence that uh, God was serious. Um, and something we should not forget, God, God is serious. Yes, he loves us. He wants everyone to be saved. But we better be careful if we are disobedient um, shall we say, uh, without thinking. That's one thing to be tempted and fall. It's another thing to um, just do it anyway. Dave? Their faith is amazing, and what was associated with their faith was a tremendous confidence. If we think back to, um, um, to the Reformers, there were many Reformers who had wonderful faith, went to be burned at the stake, and were burned at the stake. And uh, so we have to realize that God is sovereign and his, he has a plan, but people have been burned at the stake and they have been killed and, and, and they died singing the glory to God. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted to give these, these boys, because I, I think he liked them, he wanted to give them a second chance and they said, "Can you don't, hold the music, you don't need to play the music again. We're not, we're, not, we're not bound down to that, we serve God. So the confidence was there and like Job, though he slay me, I, I, will, I will serve him. Um, and I, I agree, um, they had, um, well, it's possible they weren't particularly happy with their life in Babylon anyway. I mean, they were captives. Um, there's been a, a fair amount of discussion that I've heard as to whether Daniel and his, and his three friends were made eunuchs or not. Um, doesn't come out and say that, but it does say that when... Um, the test for the food came, it was the captain of the eunuchs that Daniel went to and said, you know, we want a different diet. So there's a very good possibility that Daniel and his friends were eunuchs. And I'm not going to go into everything that that implies. Look it up later and you'll find out that it's not a pleasant thing. Um, uh, I looked it up and, and most everything that I saw uh, indicated pretty much the same thing. It's not something you want to be. Um, so, uh, they were, I don't remember your name, Stanley, Manley, what? No, it's Shuley Liumash. Stewie. Yeah. I can remember Stewie. No, uh, but the thing is, um, these three he Hebrews, they, they said, hey, we don't know what God's going to do here, but we know he can save us from the furnace. But it doesn't matter whether he does or not. We're still not bowing down. So um, they, they weren't presumptuous. They weren't saying, we know that God is going to save us from the furnace. As these uh, reformers, you know, God could have saved them from the stake. Uh, he, he could have made the fire so it didn't light. He could have, he could have made the fire so it didn't burn them. Uh, but... Um, the, the fact is that they had confidence in God and it didn't matter what happened, they still were not going to bow down. Um, you know, it's, um, it's interesting uh, to me that um, this story makes it sound like it was easy to say, oh, I'd rather be thrown into a fiery furnace than to bow down or to disobey the word of God. And... Um, uh, but it's, it's not. It, it is a true test of faith. And it's not... I don't know if anybody here has the faith to go through something like that. Um, and it doesn't matter because we haven't been put to that test. Mm -hmm. What matters is, are we going to have the faith if we're put to that test? And if we don't have the faith, whose fault is it? It's ours. It's, ours. it's our fault because... We did not take the opportunities that God has given us to build our faith. Hey, I'm Greg. 
uh, if you stop and look at the results, had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego died, their witness would have been far less than the fact that they lived because it witnessed to the whole group of all of the country's leaders that were there that their god was more powerful than any of the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. You look at the, uh, the reformers on the other hand, their witness was more powerful by them dying than by their living because for everyone that died there were thousands that came into the message because the, the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the gospel. They, where more and more people came. Yes, very true. Um, if we go look at um, Daniel chapter 3, uh, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. In this text, a lot of times I've overlooked uh, part of this text, but it's very important and I think we should keep it in mind. And he will deliver us out of your hand. I think that was a prophetic statement that God put in their mouth that they didn't really think of because God will deliver them out of his hand. And who is the his here? I don't believe it's Nebuchadnezzar. I believe the his is death. Um, Dave? Sometimes we forget that it's all of the little things that God tests our faith. I think with the three Hebrews, they had passed the little test all along the way, and they were ready for this big test. And, you know, God is not going to take us from little faith to something like that, you know, where we would be thrown into the fiery furnace. Uh, because I think, you know, if we're uh, failing the little tests of our faith, we'll never get to that point where he, you know, has to throw something big. And, and so we sit here and think, oh, wow, that's a pretty scary thing. You know, to you know, have that uh, put in front of us. You know, either thrown into the fiery furnace or um, you know, you know, not worship. You know. So so anyway, my my thinking is that you know we're not going to be in that position un unless we're passing those little tests along the way. And and that's. Most likely correct. Uh, probably the majority of, of God's people will not be put to that kind of test. I mean, there's a lot of God's people out there, and we hear stories where some are put to test, but not all. And uh, I think, um, well, of course, God knows what's best, and he knows who to test and who not to test, and it's his choice as to who he's going to test and, and why he tests us and in what manner he tests us. Um, but something that I have not seen associated with this uh, particular story in the Bible is these Hebrews were convinced that God was going to save them from what? Going to save them from death. Not necessarily death in this fiery furnace, but death period. In other words, did they not have faith in the resurrection? They must have. Otherwise, why would they say, who told you, told you, why would they say, he will deliver us out of your hand? Even though they had said, he may not save us from the fiery furnace, he will deliver us out of your hand. These three Hebrews, and we'll include Daniel in this, they had faith that God was going to resurrect them from death. Now, I don't know how much information they uh, had we only have the um, uh, they didn't even have all of the Old Testament they only had maybe the first half to have this belief in God so they believed in a resurrection did they not that's pretty that's pretty tremendous isn't it had they seen any signs that God had resurrected anybody from the dead 
prior to that. Not that I'm aware of. They have, we have the story of Enoch. We have the story of Job. But Job's children were not resurrected from the dead, from dead. He just had more. So there really wasn't an example like we have from the New Testament that there was a resurrection. We didn't, they did not have a revelation where, and Paul's writing, where we're given a, a pretty descriptive instance of uh, what was going to happen in the end times. So this was pretty amazing. I mean, we've got a lot more things to base our faith on and that belief in the resurrection than they did, and yet they believed in a resurrection. It's obvious they believed in a resurrection because they couldn't have said that if they hadn't. And the fact that they were willing to die in a fiery furnace, if they didn't believe in the resurrection, why not bow down? What did they have to lose if they didn't, if they bowed down and worshiped the king, if there was no resurrection? So I think, uh, this is Wiley, I think it's important to remember these guys, um, they had studied for a long time, all their lives. They knew who God was. They knew what he was capable of. And for us to kind of piggyback on what David was saying, when we're met with that test, if we're not prepared for it, we will not pass that test. How many Hebrews were in the crowd with these other three guys? How many bowed down? So our as far role, as we know, all of them bowed down except all these three. except for these three. Were they not a remnant of God's people? Yes. Do what they were tying their shoes. So, so I think our lesson for me here anyway is that it's important for me to study the Word of God, have the Word of God in me, yeah. so that when I am presented with that, not necessarily being thrown into a fire, but that, that comment that someone makes, or whatever happens in my life, that I can pass the test because I have the Word of God in me. Yeah. That's right. Um, we... Um, We must not forget that um, we don't know what God's plan is specifically for our lives other than what the Bible gives us. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, if we look at the world around us, um, and I was thinking about this last night, we have all kinds of signs of the end of times, don't we? I mean, we have, you can't look at the news without seeing something horrible that one person has done to another, or one nation has done to another, or... A uh, father has killed his wife and children and then gone to work, or a mother has killed her children and gone to work, or other kind of crazy things. Now, man's pretty evil, and he's been doing evil things for uh, thousands of years, but we see more of it because of the Internet, don't we? I mean, something happens anywhere in the world, it gets on the Internet, and pretty soon everybody knows about it. So whether things are really worse than they were 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago, I don't know. But everybody knows about it. So knowledge has increased. We are at the end of times. And if, um, well, there's a, a, let's find it here, in Revelation, if I can find it quickly, um, on. Revelation 13. Uh, verse 11. This is very, very similar to what happened to uh, Daniel's friends. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, idolatry, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven, to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause, this is the important part, and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now this is yet to come, is it not? Maybe in our day, maybe not in our day, I do not know. Um, but there sure is, it sure is coming. If you believe the Bible, it sure is coming. If you don't believe this, then you really don't believe the Bible, do you? Um, 
And it goes on in verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man. Dave. You know, not to minimize all of this, but I grew up in the Adventist church, and so I'm familiar with all of these verses. But we, we kind of look towards these big events and all, but every day, every moment, we're faced with decisions, choices, and it's passing those uh, tests all along the way. So we may come up to this time where we can't buy and sell and so forth. Okay, we, we recognize this. But you know, if we haven't developed a Christ-like character up to that point, all of that doesn't matter. We've missed out. Um, that's true if we are confident in our salvation. Someone over here had a question? Yeah, uh, we were talking earlier about in your mind not worshiping but bowing down just going through the motions but it says if you take if you take the mark even in your right hand not in your mind so if, even if you just go through the motions not believing in it you bow down. That's right. Um, now okay they refused. They told Nebuchadnezzar we're not going to do it no matter what. So Nebuchadnezzar was outraged. He gave he probably, somebody said, he probably liked these three men, and most certainly he probably did. Um, and let's keep in mind that um, somebody said they were familiar with um, uh, uh, the God of uh, Israel. They were familiar with the worship. They were familiar with all the texts that had been written. Um, and very so, because these men were not, I'll use the term, peasants working in the field. They came from the elite in uh, uh, Israel. Um, in Hebrew uh, courts. So because when one nation conquered another nation, they didn't take the peasants out of the field and put them in charge. They took the royalty who probably had some uh, education already and made them in charge of things in their kingdom. Uh, so these Hebrews had a lot of, they had a lot going on their side. Um, they were faithful. Nebuchadnezzar's angry. He says, heat that furnace up ten times hotter, or seven times harder. Was it ten or seven? Seven. Seven, seven times hotter. Well, that, of course, is absurd. Um, and a lot of people have used that particular verse to say, you know, this is just a story. It didn't really happen because you can't heat the furnace seven times hotter. Do you suppose that Nebuchadnezzar was angry and he just threw that out there, is I want that thing as hot as you can get it. Make it seven times hotter. He was like, he was burning with anger, wasn't he? He was, he was seven times hotter. We know, Stanley. That, we know that it was hot enough to kill the men that threw them in. That's, That's right. That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. This is Kelly. Certain fuels do burn hotter. There's different chemicals, and, and there are ways to make it hotter. Yeah, yes, there are, but it's not likely that they had those things. Probably all they had was some sort of wood, even though some woods burn hotter than the others, and if you throw enough on there, it really gets hot. Uh, nonetheless, like Stanley said, um, the, uh, the men that now... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound up. Now, we don't say if they were, their hands and feet were tired, tied, but I'm going to assume that their hands and feet were tied because they had to be thrown into the fiery furnace where they could have just been pushed. They had to be thrown in. And obviously, it was hot enough where the men that threw them in died. They didn't get out of there in time. Now, now they're in the fiery furnace. And what does Nebuchadnezzar see? Four men loose, walking in around, around in the fire, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Okay. He must have known what God looked like, because he. How could he know what God looked like? By what? Uh, Who told him what God looked like? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, probably. Could be, maybe the Holy Spirit. Now, number one, there was four. Didn't we not throw in three, and now there's four? 
walking around in the furnace. They threw them in bound up, so they shouldn't have been walking around in the furnace. Um, plus, this furnace was hot. Um, and uh, when they came out, they didn't even smell like they'd been near a fire. And their, their, their bindings were gone. Um, but one of the most important things in this story, uh, besides their faith, is who was in the furnace with them? Jesus was. Jesus Christ was in the furnace with them. For me, that's extremely significant. It wasn't just an angel in there with them. Um, God didn't just say, okay, you know, wave his mac and jig wand, so to speak, and they will not be hurt in the furnace, but that kind of stuff. He was in there with them. This is creator, sustainer, redeemer. This was, the, uh, this was God who knew he was going to be sacrificed. He knows the end from the beginning. He knew what was going to happen to him eventually. <laughs> That clock says I got five minutes. Go ahead. He was the one that gave him the dream in the first place, so he was able to then see the God that gave him that dream of the statue. I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, that was a foreign thing to him. Um, it's it's interesting how the Bible is translated. Um, I have the New American Standard, and... Um, Supposedly it is perhaps, a, some say it's a more accurate translation, I don't know. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, gods is not capitalized, obviously, so... Whether that's an accurate translation or whether the Son of God is an accurate translation, I don't know. But Nebuchadnezzar was convinced that that fourth person was uh, divine in some family. Now, remember, he worshipped lots of gods, so to him it was a son of a god. He still was not convinced that the Hebrew God was the one and only God. Um, you know, it's interesting, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I understand why God says that uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me because I am a jealous God. Well, that's a term that we understand, uh, uh, a jealous God, but the gods of these other countries, Babylon, Greek, Roman, uh, whatever it was, they had multiple gods. Was there a rule that you cannot, you have to only worship this God? These other gods were not jealous gods, were they? They didn't care. As long as you worshipped them occasionally, they were happy. They, didn't, they weren't like, you know, you better worship me or I'm going to get you. And yet our God demands uh, that we worship him and him alone. Seems kind of, to a, a non-believing human being, that would seem kind of selfish. Who You can be first. The other gods were wood and stone. They had no feelings. They couldn't. Be jealous. That's very true. Uh, we, we serve a God who came to earth and died for us. And even in uh, Greek mythology, Medio Persian, and all that, I don't believe they have gods doing much of anything for, for the people other than being gods. But our God, the, the God that was in the Jesus that was in the fiery furnace, hung on the cross for all of us sinners. And that's unique. That's a unique thing. Yes, it is. Um, and some religions have said that, um, how can God die? God cannot die. It, that story, you know, maybe Jesus was a prophet and yada, yada, but God cannot die. Uh, Dave. Now, it's interesting, um, after this incident, Nebuchadnezzar, um, being true to his position, you know, he calls the shots and so forth. So then he said, and this is verse 29, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and tongue which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and so forth. So uh, coercion, force, God is not that way. 
I mean, God presents evidence, and he says, you know, you choose. And so we can choose to, you know, get caught up in the world and have all kinds of gods and so forth, or we can choose to worship him. He's given us, he's given us enough evidence to choose him, but how many of us do? Okay, Marie, we're quickly running out of time. Maybe this is going to be the last comment. But we have to realize that God is jealous because he has the directions or the instructions on the care of how to keep our bodies healthy, how to keep us motivated. Because he's the only God who wants us to increase in knowledge and in health like no other God has. Anybody have a problem worshiping a, a jealous God? I don't have a problem because, like, um, uh, oh, somebody said, that man sitting right there. <laughs> now, if you had a name like Stewie, I could remember that. Um, God is, uh, he's a loving God, is he not? Why is he jealous? Let's use human terms. Why is he jealous? Now, this is just for you to think about because we're out of time and they're going to ring the bell on me any minute. Um, I have till 10.30, correct? Or is it 10.35? 10.30. He's about to ring the bell. Um, these are just some things to think about. Um, why is our God a jealous God? Um, why did Jesus go into that fiery furnace with those men instead of sending an angel or just protecting them? He could have done either one of those. Um, uh, and... What can we do in our lives uh, to allow God to build faith in us? After all, we are saved by faith, are we not? Um, and something else that uh, I want us to think about uh, today and, uh, is that question that the pastor asked in his survey. Are you assured of your uh, salvation? Uh, and you can't, for me, I have to think about that because there's so so much information in the Bible that came into my mind that um, made the answer, uh, it's a personal answer, isn't it? We have to answer that personally, and everybody's in a different spot. So we have to be assured of our salvation. Do we not? We should be. We should be assured of our salvation. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we... Um, this is a great lesson. Uh, it's a lesson we all need to think about and contemplate. Not only um, a lesson for the past, but a lesson for the future. Um, we don't know what the future has for us. Um, we don't know if any of us will be martyred or saved from martyrdom. Um, all we can do is put our faith in you. And that's not our own faith. You gave it to us. So um, we ask for whatever measure of faith we need to make it through the day as it is. We ask that um, you will forgive us of our sins and more so cleanse us of our sins. Put it in our hearts and in our minds that we would rather die than um, disobey your commands. Um, there's nothing here on this earth that's going to make it to heaven except us. All of our accomplishments, all of our things, our toys, our property, um, nothing. It'll all be burned up. So let us keep that in mind as we live our daily lives and know that you are our God, you are our sustainer, and you love us with a love we don't even understand. We thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.